On this week's episode of Be More Super, the podcast, we've got a great guest. You've seen him in Bitten, History of Violence, Bloodthirsty, V Wars, Rabid, the lid, list goes on. He's a great actor from Canada. It's Greg Brick. Greg, welcome to the show, sir. It's a pleasure being here with you. And how is everything at the moment with COVID where you are? I mean, how uh, how are you and the family surviving? We, you know, it's strange. Canada's still very, uh, very much locked down. Um, I, I think we're, we're, we have this, we have this still the strictest lockdown in, in uh, North America. So it's, it's a weird time. The industry's open. Uh, there's been, they have mm. a really great testing protocol in place. Um, so, so that's good. My sons were both home when this hit. They, my oldest one lives in Los Angeles. Um, but so they were home. So we spent a really long, uh, intense time in a condominium together while our house was being renovated. But they are off now. My oldest son is in the UK shooting a series right now. And my middle son oh, wow. uh, just got back. Yeah, just got is in New York right now. But he just finished shooting a movie. Jesse Eisenberg's new uh, directorial debut. He was shooting that in New Mexico. So um, it's just my wife and my daughter and I at home right now. And uh, look, it's it's been a really challenging time for everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. I very much look forward to a return to normal um, and, uh, you know, just sort of try to stay positive until that happens. How about yourself? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult. The best, best of times. But having kids, I think that's the most difficult thing, because as a husband and a father, you're sort of, you know, you feel that you've got to be the alpha male, sort of the protector, the person that mm -hmm. that keeps the family together. And I feel the best, best of times, you know, with this pandemic, you sort of feel out of control because, you know, you have followed the restrictions. You've got to keep safe. Me and my wife are key workers. So, mm -hmm. you know, we've been working throughout this. Um, right. You know, my, my wife has been exposed with people with COVID on a daily basis. So it's been quite um stressful the best of times mm. but it's my girls i've got a three-year-old and a seven-year-old so for, <laughs> them, for them you know being stuck in a house don't get me wrong was fun at the beginning because yeah. these are moments that you can never take back and it's great having that time with your kids uh but they they are climbing the walls they've gone back to school but this is something they're gonna forever remember and you know the worrying part is the social anxiety of of of, of it and my three-year-old is going to be bizarre for her when she sees people without masks on but i can't yeah. wait for that i really can't yeah i'm i'm with you on that i that's my uh, you know my kids are a little bit obviously are older now and i can't it was enough when you could get them out to the park and play dates and mm. friends and all i mean regular school and all of those things so the challenges for parents that are you know, trying to maintain their lives in a very confusing time and, and also entertain the kids and raise them and mm -hmm. find time for yourself and teach them. It's just, it's, it's been a real challenge for everybody. And, and hopefully on the other side, the kids, you know, they're resilient and they'll mm -hmm. bounce back mm -hmm. and, and, and get into the swing of things. But I do, I do worry about sort of five years from now, um, mm -hmm. th those developmental phases that we, the kids have sort of been robbed of, both educationally, but also just socially, like whether they, there will be little uh, little gaps in our in our uh, in a generation. But we'll see. Mm, and I can't wait for it all to be over and that explosion <laughs> yeah. of happiness. And oh. you know, I I just can't wait. I mean, people in the U the UK they're celebrating because they can go to yeah. a pub and have a pint. Me, yeah. I can't wait till I can take the kids to a zoo or take them out to the park, um, yeah. which is more more important but you know what as you said we've got to be positive uh keep safe follow the instructions and uh, again be resilient and um get 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 through it but let's talk about uh a bit about you greg because i tell you i tell you i tell you what there's so many layers to you it's unbelievable it really is and your body of work is so impressive over the years Thank you. from a young age did you always want to be an actor no no, I was always, um, you know, I had a very active imagination as a kid and uh, a, a sort of a funny story my mom likes to tell me is I used to you know, change clothes all the time and, and talk to myself a lot. And my mom once asked when I was a little boy, like, why do you change clothes? Like, why are you always changing clothes? And I said, well, it's no fun being me. 
Um, so I wonder if that sort of stuck with me somewhere, this need to change and experience different personalities or different lives that I'm not actually living. Um, but, but acting was, I went to a university called Queens University in, in Canada and I played football. I went there to, to play football and, and like not soccer, like American style football, but the Canadian version. And, uh, you know, went, played, uh, won a national championship. And in my third year, I had, um, I, I had an, a spare, an elective. And I was going to be a lawyer. I was going to go to law school. That was sort of my trajectory. Mm. And, uh, and I took a playwriting class. And the professor just really liked the way I wrote and read my own stuff. And he encouraged me to audition for a play the following year, uh, which was Hamlet. And uh, I did. And, uh, and, and he cast me as Hamlet and that was my first play. And in the, on the night I was cast as Hamlet was the night I kissed my wife for the first time. So I was falling in love with her and with acting all at the same time. And life just sort of became this faster and faster dance. We, uh, we packed mm -hmm. a little suitcase and moved to New York the following year. And I went to theater school and then got her pregnant. We had a baby and we, so we started this family and this adventure and, you know, 25 years of marriage this year later and wow. three beautiful kids, two of which are um, working actors right now, doing extremely well. And my daughter just got her first agent and is going to university, but has sort of started that path as well. It's been a, it's not without its its challenges and not without its heartbreaks. And there have been many, many of both. But uh, while, of while studying at Queen's University, because I study drama as well. Oh, yeah. And absolutely loved it. Um, I mean, what Amazing. was your experience like? I mean, what were the ups and downs? What were your favorite productions that you did while at Queen's? Well, so at Queen's, I just, Hamlet was the one play I did because that was at the, the beginning of my fourth year. And then after uh, I went to Queen's, I went to a, a theater school in New York, in the Circle in the Square, which um, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman had gone to, Benicio del Toro. Um, and when I was there, I got to do play Quentin in um, in Miller's After the Fall, and that was extraordinary. And, and from there, went to the Stratford Festival in Canada, the Shakespeare Festival, and spent a couple of years, and and then uh, leaned into a life of, uh, of film and TV. Um, but it's been again, it's been really. Uh, it's been really, really interesting. I, I, you know, Queens was more like a university experience than a than a drama experience because I only started mm. taking an acting class in my last year. It was more about, you know, playing football and studying Russian literature and philosophy and psychology and 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 just having a, a, a classic uh, university experience. And then New York was was really where my training began in earnest. And and I feel forever grateful to a number of teachers I had there that really helped me find myself not only as an actor but as a person and to have the courage to use those parts of ourselves that scare us or we're most vulnerable with and um mm. and do that generously and and uh, you know it's it's i think it adds to, to the work while playing football in uh, mm -hmm. university university was there any moment that you thought actually i really enjoy this i could do this for a career or was that just part of the program well, I, you know, I was a, a good football player. I was, a, you know, an all Canadian football player, but not, I don't think good enough to play at the professional level. I'm pretty certain mm. in Canada or the States, but we did after my third year or before my third year, we went to the UK because American style football was just taking hold there. So our team went to go play some exhibition games and uh, they had a, 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 a very fledgling professional league. And we played a team in London, and uh, and I had a very good game. And, and they inquired after whether I would be interested in coming to play professionally over in the UK. But um, but my uh, life took a different direction. And, uh, and as much as as much as I loved football, um, that wasn't that wasn't really where I was gonna. Uh, mm. It's it's, it's a real course. pity because I can remember years ago, uh, you know, the football scene in England. You had the London Monarchs. And yeah. they were enormous. And it's starting to get back in. I mean, I used to play American football as well. Amazing. Um, 
which 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 was awesome. I was a, I was a defensive tackle, and um, I loved Good it. Man. Absolutely, think the sport is amazing. It really really is, and people don't understand how much of a contact sport it actually is because they think that because you're wearing pads, it's for wimps. And I've got to say, it's definitely not. It is definitely, well, because, definitely not. You know, rugby is a very tough game as well. But mm. it, and and but the difference is in rugby the the tackling uh, is is you, it's more of a pulling tackle because you know you are you're on pad. It's a very aggressive game. But in football, so much of it is helmet to helmet contact. And I know that mm. you know now that I get older, um, I I sort of start to feel the lingering effects of. I, I mean, I had a ton of concussions growing up, and and now just sort of. You know, you struggle with a little bit of vertigo and, and, you know, some some other things like that, that you, you just wonder how much of a toll smashing your head at full speed against other large armor clad men uh, does to you in the long term. But God, it was fun when it was happening. And it's always the case that the person that always hits you seems to be twice as big as you. Right. And yeah. You think, no, there's some big, big lads here? in that sport. There is. So after obviously graduation and you move, you go to New York, when did you feel in your early years, when did you feel the moment that, that this is it, this is actually, you know, working out, this is, you know, going to be my life? Well, I've, I'm stubborn. So I, I always had, um, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. It was very hard for the first while because you know, we had one son, uh, well, our first child, and then I went to Stratford for a couple of years, and then we had a second, our second, and it was tough. And I, I left the the festival and came to Toronto and and sort of tried to make a go of it, but it was very hard, tough sledding. I mean, there was a lot of a lot of very very lean years where you know waiting tables was how we kept the lights on, and we moved around a lot, and we didn't we didn't have. A lot of luxuries uh the boys growing up for sure um and it was hard on on my family but i persevered and, and at one point i remember it, I, we had a marriage counselor um i recommend them for all those married folk because there's times when you're just so lost um that it's it's nice to just have a voice that is like a a lighthouse calling you to the shore but he said to me and this this one didn't last long but he's like when are you going to grow up you've got a wife and kids you have to provide for so i actually thought this just isn't working out. And I wrote, um, you know, I had done very well in school and I wrote my LSATs to go to law school. And I thought, well, I gotta, I gotta grow up. And, and then I got cast um, in a movie called Men With Brooms, which was with Leslie Nielsen and Paul Gross, a couple of Canadian icons. And I did that um, and, and things picked up a little bit, but the, the moment that changed my career for sure was a history of violence. When David Cronenberg mm. passed me in that film, and it was just so uh, well received critically, and and it had a bit of commercial success as well, and and that that um, although it wasn't that much screen time, it was a very impactful moment for me. And the American studios got uh, became aware of me, and then they uh, New Line cast me in shoot him up op opposite Paul Giamatti and Clive Owen and Monica Bellucci. And, um, and then I just went, um, it was funny, the gentleman who was in history of violence with me, my partner, a, a really wonderful Canadian actor named Stephen McCaddy. He and I did 13 movies and TV shows in the, the next five years after history of violence that people wow. just would cast. If one was in something, they'd some, they'd cast the other. And if he was in something, they'd cast me. It was a very strange, um, little dance we had, but that history of violence changed, changed things because I went from, um, you know, working very sporadically to, to starting to build a career. And, uh, and I've been very fortunate that that has continued over the years. And I've been really blessed with some amazing characters. I play a lot of bad guys, obviously. I play a lot of others. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, comfortable, <laughs> I'm, com I'm, I'm comfortable playing in the shadows and, and not censoring the monster within but but i also get a chance to spread my wings a little bit and, and play some pretty complicated interesting uh anti-hero or off leading men that's that's for sure which i'm sure we're going to have a chat about very shortly um would you say the industry's changed over the years from when you started out to what it what it is is now because 
we're, we're hearing so many stories from Hollywood, as they say, about directors that are absolutely terrible to the con- controversy within Hollywood. I mean, have you noticed the change personally? I, I have. I think it's become much more politically aware. Um, I think that it's... Um, well, right now is such a strange time. Like I, I feel, I feel. I'll, even though there's only been a year and a half that this mm. COVID things, I feel so disconnected from the industry I I knew because even now on set we're all wearing masks and everyone's you know until the camera's rolling and it's just this the sense of that um that outlaw uh, tribe that we were all a part of feels so it feels very antiseptic right now. So it's strange, but I think the I think that in some ways the the business is is good there's an awareness there's an appetite for new voices for diverse voices um people are culturally curious uh there's much much more opportunity um for new voices to emerge for for a different representation um Mm. sometimes i i sometimes i i think that i think that it's important to celebrate great storytelling no matter where it's from but I think that that should still be the the the, the criteria is that we're still trying to create great stories. I I don't um. Mm-hmm. You know I think that it still is a, it's a business and and you know Black Panther comes out and makes a billion dollars because it was great storytelling and charismatic mm-hmm. performances yeah. and and it's amazing and people watch you know like Moonlight and stuff like that. There there's just it's great, it's great storytelling and and I worry I concern that I, my concern is that as a society when we when we check boxes rather than look inside the boxes and really explore artists for what they are, but rather what they represent that, that, that mm. is, it just feels less, it moves to me, it moves away from what the, the thrust of, of art is, which is to share our com- common humanity. So um, I think that we're going through a phase right now that will, that, that is necessary and long overdue. There's a, a definitely an accounting for some people who behave very badly. Um, but I hope we get to a point where it's it just everything feels kind of like hard lined between people and groups right now. I, whereas it used to be a bit, you know, a bit um, messier. Like we, everyone was kind of just coloring outside the lines and was willing to take risks. And sometimes, you know, it's okay to have myself included, my feelings hurt, or to have my assumptions challenged. And I think that makes us stronger in a lot of ways. I just don't want us to shy away from the hard truths. Well, one thing that's come out of Hollywood in the last uh, year, I've got to say, I mean, with the pandemic, obviously every, everything is slowed down a bit and obviously production is getting back to normal. Uh, but earlier on in the year, in April, you had a movie come out called Bloodthirsty, yeah. which I've got to say was an awesome movie. Uh, oh, thank the, the you. One thing thank I liked, you. The one thing I liked about it is that you play a music producer that's got a... a, a a secret you can tell that and then i love the way the movie gradually gets you to the point where you're questioning what it is the thing is i don't want to spoil it for anyone because i've seen interviews about that movie and straight off the bat they tell people what the end is and i think that you know i love to enjoy movies without knowing i i I hardly watch trailers as well because it's nice they give so much away yeah, exactly. They give all like the best, best bits. So, yeah. in, in a nutshell, if you could tell me a bit about the movie and who you play. So the the movie's called Bloodthirsty, and it's about a young, a very talented uh, singer musician who, after writing, uh, releasing her first album, is having that second album doubt. She wants it to be great. She is concerned, and I play a music producer, an eccentric, uh, reclusive music producer with a bit of um, a controversial past where there's some suspicion, there was a, a suspicious death surrounding me. Mm. And um, But I'm known to be brilliant and I'm known to be able to draw great performances out of people. So she comes to work with me and there is... Um, there are dynamics uh, at play and and genre elements that come into play. But at at the heart of it, and what drew me to it is, the story is what sacrifices do we have to make to be great? Mm. And that's a real question because there is the pound of flesh that 
that greatness demands. There's times when an artist is not polite or germane or socially acceptable because they're having to inhabit bits of humanity that we don't often um, share with others. Uh, you know, you look at great athletes and the, the, the sacrifice that it takes to achieve that level, the commitment, the singularity, the almost the selfishness. And, and I know that's a bad word in society, but it also mm -hmm. is, it is also the win behind a lot of the greatest achievements in art and literature and science and, and just human endeavor is that selfish son of a bitch who will sacrifice everything in pursuit of that vision male or female i mean the, the the history books are filled with the stories of the person who gave up everything in pursuit of that one magical thing that that burned inside their heart so that this movie really explores that uh, and it has a very interesting angle it, it the the manifestation of that sacrifice and that ruthless willingness to be great is um uh, is is exciting? Did and I not give anything away? Did, did I talk around yeah, that night? No, you you did it perfectly, Greg. <laughs> um, the, mu the music in it as well is fantastic. Yeah. I've got to say, I mean, uh, the writing of the music the, is so yeah. I um so Lowell the the woman who one of the producers is a woman named Wendy um and and I had just finished I had been working on a movie with her before this is back in two thousand like the late fall of 2019, uh, a, a wonderful story. Uh, the movie's just coming out now, actually, um, called Marlene. But it's it's a story about um, Stephen Truscott um, and his wife, Marlene. Stephen Truscott, it's a very famous Canadian criminal case. When he was uh, 14 years old, he was accused and convicted of um, raping and murdering one of his classmates. And he was sent to death row to hang. And then... It, it turns out it wasn't him. And after spending a decade in prison and on death row, he was released. But one of the conditions of his release was that he had to live under an assumed name. So he, this this man and his wife, and his wife was a, a woman who actually fought to help get him released when he was a teenager from prison. Mm. Um, they raised a family in anonymity. And then when they got into their late 40s, she was just she was bothered by the fact that 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 they had been living a lie and they fought to clear his name so the movie is about uh, i play steven um in his like 40s through late 60s my my oldest son dempsey played me the young steven right out of jail so that was a great wow. thrill um but but as we were shooting that movie wendy and her daughter lowell wrote were writing bloodthirsty and Lowell's a, a wonderful musician, and she wrote all the music for it. They gave me the script. I liked it. And I came back um, out west to shoot with them the following year. And I uh, got to meet Lauren Beatty, who was my co-star in this. And she is um, a musician herself. I had no idea how beautiful her voice would be and how beautiful the music would be. But one of the first days shooting, we were in the studio, like shooting the studio, one of the studio scenes, working on one of the songs. And... Her voice was so pure and haunting that it really affected me um, in, a, in a quite um, profound way. And I opened up to her in a way like she I felt like I was like a 14 year old boy again, just on the cusp of of, of a new life and a new adventure. And it, it brought a different dynamic to our relationship, which on the page was quite calculating and Machiavellian. And, and then it just brought a warmth and um and a genuine affection through the music that, that wasn't in the script, but I think informed our relationship. And when you watch the movie, you'll see how complicated that relationship becomes. And your your your, your character in the movie is quite intense and it's quite, um, it's just awesome. I mean, how do you prepare for a role like that? I mean, obviously you get that script. What, what does the process look like to prepare to be Vaughn? Well, I mean, I'm always looking for my points of similarity between characters or, you know, like what, what is it that I, what, what do I feel in, in, in that character and, and just find those access points. And then 
it's like uh you know trying to dance into a shadow so i i, I do all of that like per, i work very personally uh, you know a sort of i don't want to say the word method because it gets so misunderstood but i work from things that actually mean something to me um so i i understood this idea of pushing towards truth and greatness and as you know as a mentor to my kids growing up with acting i was i mean kind of in hindsight a monster when i would prepare them for little school auditions they'd be like i remember my son billy was like eight and he was auditioning for charlie in the chocolate factory <laughs> and he was the scene was you know where he finds the magic ticket and he's in the cold and he's shivering and he and he finds this ticket and it's like hope and he's doing it and i remember going like that's bullshit you're not cold <laughs> like you know what cold is you know what being poor is we've been so poor like this is it and you know, he's crying and i'm like go now and then he does the scene and it was beautiful and then he ended up you know doing that on the audition and he you know that was his first thing that was his but i i i have a, I, I don't I don't like I'm a bit of a madman when it comes to acting because I love it so much and I just don't like lies. Like I know mm. we lie in real life all the time, but in art I just don't abide by it. I just don't there's a truth and it 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 there's a toll that like for example, if you have a scene where you you know, I have a big emotional scene and you break down, you have to put yourself in a place and, and work with either a memory or work with an imaginary circumstance that, that really, really upsets you. And then you, something real happens to you. And if something real happens to you, the audience is going to feel that and they're going to share in that experience because they'll all have at one point in their life have to bury someone that they love or say goodbye to someone that they don't want to say goodbye to. So. You know, I think that that's my responsibility as an actor is to go to those places. So that that I understood, Yvonne demanding, you know, in a weird way, like, like that's what his criteria is for excellence is just this honesty, this truth. Um, so that I understood. I, I understand not necessarily liking being around people all the time. I understood. I understood being isolated like that. Um, I also find that I don't. I like to um, prepare, but not decide. I find so much magic happens between two people accidentally on a set when you don't, when you haven't predetermined what the scene is going to be or what the movie is going to be other than the, the broad strokes and the writing is there. But like what happens between people is always magic. And I like mm. to be open to that. And I feel so I'm, I'm of this wonderful career that's afforded me a lot of great opportunities. I think the connections with people while the cameras are rolling are, some of my favorite because everything strips away and everything gets very quiet and everything gets very simple. And it's just two people trying to figure out what it means to be human together. And that's quite a, a beautiful, um, beautiful way to make a living. And it's awesome that your kids are following in your footsteps. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I tried to, I, I really like, uh, I, I had a hard time with that because my career although it's you know it's turned out to be amazing it's it's it was very difficult and it's it's mm. put a lot of puts a lot of hardship on a lot of people around you both emotionally and financially a lot in a lot of things and my oldest son well all of my kids actually are brilliant students and my oldest son had a full um scholarship to the top like the the, the what would be the canadian version of the harvard school of business and um and he was gonna go and and he he had an inkling that he maybe wanted to act and i was like but you know he was a a wonderful uh, boxer you know champion amateur boxer in ontario and a, a soccer player that played on teams that traveled through europe and you know was his brilliant student and and he was gonna go have a normal life and and have a successful career and then he said well you know, I'm thinking about going to theater school. And I was like, no, 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 you're not <laughs> at all. Like, you're just not. And I, I said, well, fine, you can maybe maybe a summer program, sort of like get it out of your system. And he went to New York and he auditioned for these schools. And he came home one weekend from university and he said, I, I have to tell you something. And, and I was like, what? And he goes, well, I lied to you. I, okay, like what? And he goes, well, I didn't audition for the summer programs. I auditioned for all the conservatories and I got in everywhere. And I'm going to go to New York and I'm going to become an actor. And he said, you can either, you can help me 
or you can be an obstacle that I have to overcome, you can decide. And, uh, and, and his falling in love with acting for the first time came at a time in my life where I'd been in it for a while and you start to worry more about the, you know, you've got mortgages and you know, you will understand this and bills and all that. And it's mm-hmm. more about like, okay, well, how much am I going to get paid? And well, like, what is this? And, you know, you, you get caught up in the business side of life and, and art and, and to see it fresh through his and his colleagues and classmates eyes. And then going back to New York to visit him when he was in school, it, it, it reinvigorated me. And there I went through sort of, um, very much a creative rebirth and, um, found the joy of it again and and that's been for the last you know seven or eight years i think i've done the best work of my life and the most daring and freedom and and just the 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 sheer joy of creation is back and and now you know i get to share these moments with my kids and i've done a few movies with my oldest um I shot a little bit of a movie with my my middle son, who the older one wrote and directed. So that was amazing. And you know, we all help each other with auditions, and and it's it's the language we speak with each other, and it is very much a language of love. I mean, you must must be very proud because even though you didn't want him to go into, you know, the 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 theater studies, you know, yeah. he obviously knew what he wanted, and that, yeah. that must be fantastic because. To have kids nowadays to to know what they want to do and actually go after their dreams is is very rare. So you must be very proud, and they must get the stubbornness from you. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm incredibly proud, and 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 just so grateful. Though, you know, I, I laugh. I say I, I wear a, a badge of my failure as a parent that I've made interesting artists as kids. Um, you know, like obviously I didn't give them the most stable upbringing that they have this need, but they all have the courage to chase their dreams. And I think that's the greatest gift we can give our kids. It's just the confidence and the courage to, to, to stake everything on chasing what they want most in life. And and we don't get mm-hmm. two kicks at this as far as I know. And um, mm-hmm. life is too short to live someone else's dream for you. So the fact that they've all have the fortitude and the tenacity and the resilience to, to chase this, life of storytellers to me is is really really quite lovely and a lot of people out there think that acting is quite an easy job because they see what they see on screen they don't see the auditions the rejection um you know which is absolutely horrible it really is how do you find auditions do you enjoy them or do you hate hate them because auditions some say is an art form in, in itself it is. Um, it's taken me. I do. I do like auditioning. I'm a competitive person by nature. I like competing for things. I loved in the day when, I mean, now because of particularly because of COVID, but also just the nature of technology, you do so much self taping, which mm. to me has a little bit of the danger removed. You know, I like going into a room knowing that you get like one shot at it, and there's just a heightened state. Whereas when you're self taping, I mean, you can do as many takes as you want and um but but it's still valuable i love i love being offered things as well um i think sometimes my ego gets in the way if if someone wants me to read for something and you know i'll be kind of like they they you know i've done a hundred movies and tv shows now like you got a pretty good idea of what i can do um but then that's just that's ego um it's thrilling still i i get as much joy um reading for my kids also off camera. I just love acting. Like, you know, I don't care what side of the camera it's on, whether I'm, you know, playing off, off camera, just, you know, giving the performance on the other side or, or, or being in front of the camera, there's always the opportunity to share something um, real. And that's, uh, that's great. So yeah, you know, it's part of the, it's part of the gig. Some people hate it. Some people are just the anxiety of auditioning gets to them. For me, it's the waiting. The waiting is very, very hard. I find that almost harder than the rejection. Like when I'm on pins and needles and, you know, wanting it so badly, it it gets to be a bit distracting. My, my, my family laughs at me because I'm, I'm truly a madman. Like I'm just not there while I'm waiting. But if I hear no, then it's gone. Like it's like, okay. Um, It can be heartbreaking for sure. I mean, this year I had a couple of really, um, what would have been very, very special, 
projects and characters that I just felt very connected to that I got very close to it happening. And, uh, you know, at the end, it was a bit of a name game and, and you can't, you can't beat fame on some level. So it's, um, you know, you, you actors, we do, you see the glamour, you see award shows, you, or you see just like, Oh, that looks like that'd be fun riding a horse and swinging a sword or whatever, or, 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 you know, seducing the girl or fighting or whatever it is but that there there's there's so much loneliness on the other side of that and there's so much insecurity and self-doubt and and because it's so subjective you never know why not mm. you or why you or when again and and you hear no so many so many times in your life uh uh, so yeah, I mean, look, if you have to do it and if you're compelled to do it, do it because you'll regret to your, with mm -hmm. your dying breath that you didn't give yourself the chance, but, uh, but it, it takes, it's, uh, it's a, it's a strict mistress, that one. It's funny you say about the name game because I, I had a Canadian actor, uh, on, on the show a little while back and he was mentioning the fact that. A lot of the times um, he was not considered because he was Canadian and they were choosing American actors over mm -hmm. Canadian actors. I mean, from your point of view, does that happen? I mean, yeah, all, all the time. Really? All the time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And look, I, I understand that because it's a business. So if you if someone is coming, has, you know, American, well, let's just say that they, they've been on a big show on NBC or whatever, whatever the network is. And there's a recognizability with an audience, and that's part of the 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 goal is to get eyeballs on a screen. So, that that's a reality, and and I understand that. Look, when someone mentions a name like so and so, you know, movie star, you're like, wow, like that's thrilling. Still, so that that mm -hmm. has currency. I think a lot of Canadian actors are very resentful of that, of of the fact that you know any series that comes to Canada, or ninety five percent of them, your your stars are coming from the states. And then some supporting stuff will be available here. That's why, to be perfectly honest, I've enjoyed being the bad guy so much is because it's usually the best role available here. You know, they're always, mm. uh, there's always interesting characters to play when the hero's from down south. So I think that you, as a Canadian actor, you can play leads in Canadian shows and, and movies if they can't afford an American star, but it is a business. And, and I think it would be, it's, it's naive to think that that doesn't matter or that it shouldn't matter because of, of course it should, you know, there's a reason at the very mm. top of it that a movie starring, you know, Tom Cruise or Bruce Willis or Julia Roberts in the day or whatever, that's going to open. People are going to go see it just because of them. And as you move down, mm. if you know that, Oh, so-and-so from such and such is in this, new show you'll you're you know you'll you'll check it out at least as opposed to it's a lot harder to launch a show with um a face that nobody or or is not really familiar or like maybe they've seen you around a bunch but they don't really know where they can place you so it can be it can be frustrating but that's why so many canadians go down to los angeles because that's really if you, if you want and there are exceptions to this rule, but, but if you really want to have a career at the very highest level, you have to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you really do. And, you know, I, I don't regret that there was a chance after History of Violence came out, I, I went to Los Angeles and I had great, um, I have an excellent manager now, but I had really great representation. And I had young kids who were in public school and, here and were very happy and in sports and they lived in a beautiful little community and their grandparents were lived a block and a half away. And, and I just couldn't do that to them. Mm. I couldn't take them to some suburb of Los Angeles at the time and, and bet everything that it's going to for sure work out. And professionally, do I have some regrets? Maybe, I mean, I've had a blessed career, but you know, you all often wonder, or you sometimes wonder, but would I trade that for having raised these beautiful kids and got to go to all their practices and ballet and have a marriage that survived a great many difficulties and might not have as so many, well, forget Hollywood marriages or entertainment marriages, just marriages <laughs> don't. Um, so at the end of the day, I'm, I, at the end of the day, I'm very, very happy with the choices I made. Um, and, 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 
and your body of work is enormous. I mean, is there one piece that you're very proud of um, out of everything that you've done? You know, I, I, I fall in love with every, every project that I'm on. Um, you know, I was very proud to be a part, even though I only did a few episodes of Handmaid's Tale. I was very proud of that. Um, I was proud to be in History of Violence, um, Show Frontier. I just did uh, a few years ago. I I loved bits of bits of that. This new movie, Marlene, coming out. I I I'm I'm can't, you know I'm gonna go through and I'll be annoying and and uh, and say everything. There's a couple of shows that came at the right time. There was a show that I did a genre f- series called Bitten a number of years ago, which was a werewolf a show, show that was was very special to me. It was my first sort of leading role on a on a big production um the the role itself challenged me in a way that i thought that i had to become a better person in order to be this pack alpha it 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 really forced me to do some work on myself and and it it definitely made me a better person the playing of that and then the relationships with uh with the rest of the cast have remained strong all these years later so that was that was very special being part of the uh, the Far Cry franchise for a video game. Yeah, which, yeah, jo- 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 Joseph I, Seed. Joseph yeah. Seed. I had no idea. I turned down. I turned down the audition the first time they, first couple of times they approached my agent. They had been looking for that character for two years, and they just couldn't find anybody that they just were set on. And they, I, I mean, in my ignorance, I didn't know where video games how far the narrative and, and the, the storytelling had come. And I just, I remember Tecmo Bowl, you know, when I was a kid, like playing like that, right? <laughs> and then they sent me some writing and I was, the, some of the monologues, and I was like, this is so dark and beautiful and complicated. And, and I, um, you know, I, I put something on tape and they they cast me right away and I started what has turned out to be a, an, an adventure that's lasted years over a, a couple of games and a movie and... Mm just an engagement with the community with this incredibly passionate um, and and welcoming video like gaming community that I that it was just not aware of. Yeah, I, you know what? I've never seen um, a game actually bring out like a, a, a short movie to, yeah. to go with it. And that movie was awesome. And I think it's Kyle, is it Kyle, that was in it as well? Well, no, uh, dude, which is, he's, 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 he's awesome. awesome. He's mm. awesome. He like he, uh, such an incredible actor, and what a great guy. There was a, the director guy named Barry Battles, uh, who's also an amazing guy. I was sort of looking for something to put us, Kyle and I, in together again after that because we really enjoyed each other and sort of have a very similar, like uh, off the 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 dusty path vibe about us. Um, in different ways um but yeah no that was that was a lot of fun that we shot that in montana uh which was pretty great to sort of get get to ground zero of where the story takes place yeah i've got to say i haven't played the game i've always wanted to play it and i've been waiting for ages to get it from my friend and he keeps on saying he's forgetting to uh to give it to me so uh i will make sure i will play that game you yeah i mean it's it's pretty it's pretty uh it's it's you know it's got obviously fun gameplay and stuff but some pretty interesting themes particularly now uh where we are with such a divided world and also a a, a world is brought together but also driven apart by technology i mean there's some there's some conveniences to it and and you know like you and i can talk here mm-hmm. you know across the world and whatever um but we also are you know so many kids spend all their time on a screen and they're not they're Mm -hmm. they're losing the fact that there's a world at their fingertips literally and the people that are closest to us we are isolated from in the pursuit of some sort of global community that that i think at times has benefits but also dangers because when you lose the ground beneath your feet you're you're either falling or flying but most often falling Mm, mm. but i'll definitely play that game and um it was just awesome that 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 short but in your in your career you have uh, played opposite so many great other names i mean is there an actor in question that you absolutely love to work with and would love to work with again uh elizabeth moss was incredible she is incredible um i uh Again, Donald Sutherland, I shot a little bit with a few years ago, and he was is just 
a force. Viggo Mortensen is amazing. Clive Owens, the, like one of the like most present, interesting, dynamic people I've ever met. Uh, we are like not as big a name, but I shot with, uh, I, I went and did a cameo on a film with some producers I knew with uh, Barry Pepper recently. He, he I've loved since um, Saving Private Ryan. I think that was Trigger Point. Um, yeah, Trigger Point. Yeah, which... yeah. Just went in and did that one little scene, and uh, but it was just a lot of fun uh, working with them. I, again, you know, I'm I'm dropping names because it's names that people will recognize. But I've also, you know, worked with uh, actors that are not household names by any stretch. That are just like just beautiful artists, and um, it, it's 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 really not a, a matter of talent is just a matter of exposure at that point you know those, those hidden gems like that bottle of wine that maybe only you and a couple of friends know about because it's not on the the shelves of your local <laughs> wine store it's like it's those hidden gems Definitely. so again like i've i've had the, that's the best part of this career for me is those moments with these uh, other people uh, all trying to share something of themselves and what got you in, in involved with ted because you did a ted talk and I've got to say, I love TED Talks. I could listen listen to them all day. I mean, how did you get involved, involved with TED? Because so I, you know, I went to Queen's University is where I went to school, and um, and they had called me and asked if I wanted to come speak to um, primarily the the drama students, but then some of the first year students. And I went and um, just did sort of like a free flow. And I did a little little talk, and then there was a question and answer. And the people that ran the TED society i guess at queens saw that and they approached me and asked if i would come do a um come and do a ted talk the following year and i you know i immediately said yes because i love public speaking it's actually a, a great passion and um and i felt like there i had lived enough life and had enough experiences that i had something to say and then they they got a little bit like because it's an institution they got a a bit funny about like well you know we'd like you to do it was this young guy and he's like well we'd like you to do a um like a couple of practice things and i'll give you notes and stuff and i said well that's not gonna happen because i don't exactly know what i want to say like i know roughly mm. so here's what i'm gonna do i'll write the bullet points of roughly what i'm gonna talk about but when i get there whatever happens on the day is gonna happen on the day and uh, and I went, and it was this lovely audience of of uh, of young people, primarily. I mean, there was some some faculty and and guests and stuff as well. At, at the place where I started, and earlier that day before I spoke, I went back to the theater where I first did Hamlet. This little round where I, you know, it, it was like full circle coming back home, and I think I was able to articulate. A message that resonated with some people and it's it's a, it amazes me now like i think it's close to three hundred thousand people have watched that on youtube and uh, the, the positive feedback that i've received from it has been uh, incredible and that's something i would like to do more of like i, I do enjoy mm -hmm. i really enjoy public speaking and uh, i'm a big fan of of the the jack canfields and tony robbins and jim Rohn's of the world like i think the positive I think that we there's different ways of articulating a very similar message that that you know doesn't vary too much from people but I had a way of approaching it and and just encouraging people a to be a, responsible for your life you know to be kind but that you have to live your dream and 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 write your story and I I did learn that like I found that every time I'd play a different character I would something fundamentally would change about me just through the, the sheer repetition of other another person's behaviors or another person's habits or learning skills and, and the realization that, well, like, why can't I just decide who the best version of me would be and write that out and then do what one needs to do to prepare for that role and then play it. Um, and it, it, it is, um, you know, it's been at times I go back and I need to rewatch it myself and, and, and rehear the lesson because we oftentimes get pulled in different directions with other people's expectations of us uh, and we lose sight of what we want most for ourselves. What are, what are the things I liked about your your TED talk as well is the way, you know, you you talked. It was very melodic and 
I think I, I mean I'm not I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only pers per person that, that that looks into these things but the way you pause and the way you stop and then I mean is that done completely on purpose because I know there is an art form in the way of how we present and how we talk and using pauses to for engage, engage engagement it was just fascinating to listen to and the way that you were speaking I didn't know if it was scripted or you were just speaking but it was just hypnotizing to listen to it really well was. thank you um you know i'm sure there's you, you know through training and through working with great literature and and mm -hmm. and acting a lot you you get um a sense of rhythms i think a good actor has a good sense of rhythm and a good sense of mm -hmm. taking the audience and letting thoughts land and and space between thoughts but that would there was no written like that, that, that speech wasn't written um wow. that was that was just there was uh it's funny because a lot of people assume that i was reading off of something but not only was i not reading off of something there was never anything written i knew roughly what i wanted to talk about and as i had been in the weeks leading up to it i would walk my dogs in the morning and i would sort of talk to myself and you know flashes of like scraps of this and that would sort of i guess um take shape in my mind and it and my mind held on to it enough that the form took place but that's how i used to write essays as a kid I used to drive teachers crazy because I just it was not a big fan of um, rough work of, of doing a rough draft and I had a few teachers that at some point realized that oh well he's just doing that I was just doing it in my head the whole time like I would just be thinking about it enough that it was being edited internally before it was committed to paper and in the same way that I had thought about what I wanted to say enough that when I got up there it just um, it felt like the thoughts um, were feeding each other, and and um, and and also the audience, just their response. You just mm. could feel where they were going with it, and um, I don't know. It's hard to. Uh, it was just one of those little magic moments in life that I'm uh, that I'll be forever grateful for. And of course, you're a poet as well, so uh, I suppose that helps. Uh, any more? I do love planned? language. Um, yeah, I've, I've released two books of poetry, one called, uh, towards another light and another one called other rooms. And those were quite, you know, it, it started, I wrote, uh, I mean, I've always written a lot of poetry, but just when Twitter first started and I was unbitten and, you know, we were encouraged to engage with fans socially, which was great, but I, you know, that the 144 character poem emerged. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I, I wrote so much of them, so many of them that people were asking for books. So I just did a limited, did limited releases of them. And I, I did a limited release where each one had a little snatch of new poetry inscribed that was just sort of off the top of my head and um, personalized. And then, and then there's the run that people could buy in the stores. I don't know. There's enough poems for another book for sure, but I don't know. I, I've, um, I've been writing, working on writing a series with the, the producers, um, that did uh, Frontier for Netflix, and it's another show that's called Caught that I was on. So we've been working on something. It's a bit of a tough, tough slog getting a show made. It it, it mm -hmm. turns out. Um, so so I'm doing that, and um, I, I, my best friend from college, football buddy, who is um, uh, a business investment banker. He and I are launching a business where uh, which will incorporate. Um, um sort of exploring business models and it'll involve me doing some public speaking and some keynote speaking and some mentoring and coaching and we're creating a book around that and i've also I, i've always wanted to write a novel like a maybe or, or a novella let's be uh let's <laughs> prep with first but yeah i know i like to write it's one of um it's a place i love language i love i love uh i love words i love to read it's mm -hmm. so one of my pleasures, one of my, a great scotch, a great red wine and a great book are three, three of my faves. And see, and see, see, see what the result is after all three of those. Um, right. Have you got right. any, uh, <laughs> have you got any conventions planned uh, coming up at all? Or? Well, I haven't, I haven't, there's, um, I, I, you know, I haven't done many conventions in my life. I was supposed to come do the Erpercon in the UK um before covid quashed those plans um and if they get that up and running again and i've heard some rumblings that it will be next year i would love to come out and do that um uh it's a matter of sort of invitations and and i work with a company um that will sometimes 
present opportunities. And I always love to travel and meet new people. And uh, again, particularly in genre, the genre work I've done in video games, those communities are so passionate and accepting and warm that it's always mm -hmm. a pleasure to, to meet people and take a picture and have a little chit chat. And, and, and hopefully with COVID, uh, you know, going away slowly, yeah. uh, conventions can get back to it and we can get yeah, you to the UK um, and get you to an Urpacon. And uh, I had Tim Rosen on the show last oh. last, last night. And he Isn't is, he I've got the say, best? He's so humble. It's like yeah, he doesn't realise, you know. He what... doesn't. He, do, he truly doesn't. He's, he's, he's one of my five favourite people. Um, and I, I know him, we shot a movie together and we've been acquaintance friends for years. He's so genuinely lovely, so unaffected, such a good, decent man. He's become like, he was always beautiful and dangerous. Like that was, I mean, he was a, a beautiful wild boy. Um, mm. and, and that always came across, but there's a wisdom, there's a gravitas to the work he does now. There's a, 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 a non self seriousness as well that plays so wonderfully against his look. He's just, a, he, I, I think he's an exceptional, exceptional artist and a really great human being too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do you know what? He was a joy as well. And Greg, you've been a great guest. It's been great chatting Thank to you. you. Um, I hope all the best for the future for you and the family and everyone Thank keeps you. safe. You as well. And I look forward to uh, seeing your kids work. You know, oh, uh, thanks. Yeah. What, what's, what's he doing in the UK? Can you say or can you not say? I can't say. Big, big, can't say. big, 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 big. Is it? So he's starring um, in it or yeah. is he? Yeah, yeah, he's one of the, he's one, yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll be soon enough, and that's, that'll be exciting, and the Billy um, has got, his sort of first big break was he's in the new Ghostbusters coming out, and then he also starred opposite, and I'm, I can't believe it, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the movie, but starred opposite Julianne Moore and Finn Wolfhard in Jesse Eisenberg's directorial debut, so not a bad start for his career to be one of the leads of an A24 movie opposite Julianne Moore, not, not too shabby. That is awesome. Well, I can't, yeah. can't wait for all that to come out. Greg, yeah. you've been a great guest. Look Thank you very yourself. much. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, God bless and uh, enjoy yourself.